Sergeant Polite, can you start the cloud recording, please? PC started. Recording Sergeant to the cloud, all set. Sergeant Bradley, can you give us the opening, please? Yes. Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Landmarks, Public Sightings and Disposition. At this time, all panelists, please turn on the videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or on silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin, Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Riley. I'm the chair of the subcommittee on landmarks, public sightings, and dispositions. I am joined remotely today by my council members, uh, subcommittee members, Ku, uh, council member Ku, uh, subcommittee member, council member Barron, subcommittee member, council member, member Traeger, and I believe council member Perkins is here also. Today we'll be holding a public hearing on a 40 year extension of the East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan, an HDFC ground lease amendment, and the designation of the East 25th Street Historic District in Flatbush. But first, we will vote on two items we heard at our last meeting on January 20th. We will vote to approve LU 711, the 110 Lenox Avenue ANCP cluster. This item is an application submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law, requesting waiver of the designation requirements and the requirements of Section 197-C and 197-D of the Charter, approval of an urban development action area project and approval of a real property tax exemption for properties located at 110 Lenox Avenue, 128th West 116th Street, and 1971 7th Avenue in Manhattan Council District, represented by Council Member Perkins. We will also vote to approve pre considered LU 717, the Landmark Preservation Commission's historic landmark designation of the Angel Guardian Home located at 6301 12th Avenue, block 50, 5739, part of lot one in the borough of Brooklyn in council district represented by council member Machaca. Both items have the support of the local council members. Council, please roll, please call the roll. Riley. Yes. Ku. He's on mute, Council Member Ku. I will I. Council Member Barron. Thank you. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you. I vote aye on the landmarking for the Angels Home. And on the other 110, uh, I'm abstaining because I think that while the provision for those who are presently living there to be able to purchase at a reasonable price is a great offering, I think that the offering price for those who want to become new owners there is prohibitive for the people who presently live in the district. Thank you. Traeger. Aye. On LU 711, the vote is three in the affirmative, uh, zero in the negative, one abstention. On, uh, on the uh, 110 Lennox, the vote is three in the uh, one, two, three, four, four in the affirmative, or three in the affirmative, with one abstention. Did I just say that? Yeah. <laughs> the, 
to clarify. <laughs> 711 LU 711 is three in the affirmative with one abstention. Mm -hmm. LU 717 is four in the affirmative. And the vote is held open, though the items are recommended for approval to the Foley and Use Committee. Thank you, Council. And you Councilman not Baron is asking to be recognized. Yes. Go ahead, Councilman Baron. Thank you so much. I just want to make sure that it's recorded that my abstention is for 110 Lenox Avenue. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Thank you. Thank you, Council. We will now move on to our public hearing. I recognize the subcommittee council again to review today's hearing procedures. Thank you, Chair. Just a moment. I am Jeffrey Campagna, counsel to the subcommittee. Members of the public who wish to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. If you wish to testify and have not registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov to sign up now. If you're a member of the public who wants to watch this hearing, please watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. All people testifying before the subcommittee will be on mute until they are recognized to testify. When the chair recognizes you, Please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit in lieu of appearing before the subcommittee, you can email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or project name in the subject line of the email. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions should raise the Zoom hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions in the order that they raise their hands. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until they are excused by the chair. Lastly, they may, there may be extended pauses. If we encounter technical problems, we ask that you please be patient as we work through these issues. Chair Riley will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you, Jeff. I now open up the public hearing on application number C210067 HUM submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and the development pursuant to section 505 of article 15 of the general municipal law and section 197-C of the New York City Charter requesting approval of the 16th amendment to the East Harlem East Harlem excuse me to the East Harlem urban renewal plan the amendment will extend the duration of the East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan for 40 years from, ex from its expiration date in December of 2020. The East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan includes properties in, in council di districts represented by council members Ayala and Perkins. And now we would like to give uh, council member Perkins uh, a chance if he would like to uh, address the committee on this project. Council member Perkins. Council member, you're on mute. You're on mute, Council member. Okay. Okay, so um, to repeat myself, I'm supporting these projects that are in my district. And um, that, that's, that I think is a, is a good move to, for the sake of my neighborhood and uh, for the sake of this, this neighborhood and, and for the sake of this city. You have a, a few questions. Excuse me? Yeah, a few questions there that I can. What are the questions that you're talking about? No, oh, no, here. Yeah. Well, what is the status of the MEC site on 125th Street? Council member. Council member, we're going to uh, save the questions till after uh, the applicants uh, do their testimony. Okay. So I'll come back to the questions. Oh, I'm sorry, please make sure I'm a little early on this. How soon? Uh, council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel for HPD is Libby Rolfing, Vianda Simmons, Ariel Goldberg, and James Hall. Council, please administer the affirmation. Can uh, we un unmute the applicant panel?
Please raise your right hands. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions. Yes. 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 Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation again for the record. You may begin. Great. Thank you, uh, Chair Riley. My name is Libby Rolfing. I'm the Chief of Staff for the Housing Preservation and Development Department at, uh, for New York City. And I'm going to begin uh, with my testimony. So um, this is a ULRP action in connection to an urban renewal plan to extend the duration of the urban renewal plan for 40 years continuous from the prior expiration date of the plan. In 1968, the city designated the Harlem East Harlem Urban Renewal Area and established the Harlem East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan pursuant to Article 15 of the General Municipal Law, the Urban Renewal Law. The area is located in community districts numbers 10 and 11 in the Central Harlem and East Harlem neighborhoods of Manhattan and is generally bounded by West 127th Street and East 133rd Street to the north, the Harlem River on the east, West 110th Street, East 106th Street, East 107th Street, and East 110th Street on the south, and Fifth Avenue, Madison Avenue, Park Avenue, Lexington Avenue, and Malcolm X Boulevard on the west. Though the boundary encompasses a large area, only designated urban renewal sites are subject to the restrictions of the plan. The city has amended the Harlem East Har Harlem Urban Renewal Plan 15 times, including the last amendment in 2008, the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment to the Harlem East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan included several site-specific design controls, including height, setback, and open space requirements that affect parcels still under city ownership. HPD is proposing an amendment to extend the Harlem East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan an additional 40 years for continued agency administration and management continuous from the prior expiration date of the plan. No new construction or project is asso associated with this application and the proposed action does not change the geographic scope of the Harlem East Harlem Urban Renewal Area. Today, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking approval of the 16th Amendment to the Harlem East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan. Thank you. We would like to just do a quick presentation, um, just I think would help provide some further context. Um, would oh, I see that you're sharing the screen, thank you. Um, and I will turn this over to my colleague, um, James Hall uh, to do the presentation. Thanks, Libby. Um, so again, um, my name is James Hall and I'm a Manhattan planner at HPD. I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Vianda Simmons and Ariel Goldberg. Um, this application is the 16th amendment to the Harlem East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan to extend the plan's duration for 40 years continuous from the prior expiration date of the plan. Um, urban renewal amendments are subject to the U Uniform Land Use R Review pr Procedure, and this application is certified into ULERP on September 14th, 2020. Next. Uh, so generally, urban renewal law gives the city the ability to acquire and convey sites for redevelopment in accordance with an urban renewal plan. Um, depending on the plan, this could be certain land uses, or in the case of this plan, additional design con controls. Um, the Harlem East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan was established in 1968 and su subsequently amended 15 times over the past four decades. Um, as was previously mentioned, uh, this plan expired in December 2020. The most recent amendment, the 15th amendment, was approved by the City Planning Commission and City Council in 2008. And this amendment inserted a number of site-specific de de design con controls into the plan. So I think Libby mentioned the urban renewal area, which is generally bounded by East 106th Street to the south, uh, FDR to the East Madison Park, Lex and Fifth Avenues to the west and the Harlem River Drive at East 132nd Street to the north. Um, 
So just to be very, very clear, um, though the boundary does encompass a large area, um, only sites designated as urban renewal sites are su subject to the restrictions of the plan. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so as was previously mentioned, th this plan has been amended 15 times, most recently in 2008. This amendment uh, included several site-specific design controls that do affect parcels still under city ownership. Um, so this application before you is an extension of the plan's duration for 40 years. No substantive changes or project are being pr proposed as part of this application. Um, the goal of this land use action is to facilitate the preservation of the site-specific controls that currently exist in the plan. Next slide. Thanks. Uh, so this map shows the boundary of the urban renewal area. Um, just to repeat myself like a broken record, though the boundary does encompass a large area, only sites that are designated as urban renewal sites and are acquired and conveyed are subject to the plan. Next slide. So on the design controls, uh, this, this table highlights uh, some of the design controls that would remain active if the plan is extended. Um, some of these goal, um, to, to, some of these controls also comport with the stated goals in the, of the East Harlem neighborhood plan. For example, um, the plan requires the construction of at least 700 housing units on particular sites, um, which would not be required under zoning. Uh, an active plan places a height limit on certain sites. Um, under zoning, the height limit is governed by the sky exposure plane, so very tall towers could be built on these sites. Um, an important component is also the public open space requirement in the plan, uh, which would require in total at least 12,500 square feet of open space with benches and illumination and programming on certain sites. Uh, there is no similar mechanism uh, th through the existing underlying zoning. Next slide. So just to wrap up the presentation, um, urban renewal amendments are subject to ULERP. This application certified um, on September 14th, 2020, and we look forward to answering any further questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So I do have a few questions I wanna ask. Um, and the first one is, how do you distinguish the ways that the urban renewal plan um, were used in the past opposed to the harmful consequences that they have for people of color and low income New Yorkers in the 20th century to the ways that it's being used today. Vianda, do you want to answer that one? Or Ariel? Huh. Are we are we all I don't know if we're muted okay. or not. Thank you. Yes, now I'm unmuted. Thank you for your question. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vianda Simmons. I'm the director of the Manhattan Planning Division at HPD. Um, urban renewal plans have historically um, caused uh, alarms for many um, residents nationally. Um, there's a history of displacement um, for people of color um, everywhere in terms of the way that urban renewal plans have been administered um, by government agencies and city agencies as well. Uh, in this particular case, we are focused on preserving design controls, um, as was indicated, um, was in place in 2008 to allow um, particularly the East 125th Street project, the MEC project, um, to remain contextual with the um, rest of the community. The design controls also allow for open space. That's not permitted um, by zoning. Um, and there are other um, controls as mentioned in terms of setback. Um, and so those are the design, specific design controls that we're um, looking to preserve and that are aligned with Community Board 11's uh, community district needs statements. And additionally, during this pandemic, um, during this crisis, which is still uh, in existence, many people have been looking for opportunities to really social distance on their properties and allow for more open space so that people have room. Um, and so again, these design controls allow for that to continue to remain in place as future phases of the MEC site continue to be developed over uh, the next few years that basically will take place. Okay. 
Speaking about the MEC site, um, what are the land use controls on the MEC site that this renewal will maintain? Hello? Oh, yes. Um, did you want to go over those? Um, there's a particular slide sure. that indicates several of the design controls. Yeah, if we could, is it possible to pull up the slides again and go back to the slide with the, or the table with the design controls on it? If not, that's Can okay. Can I pull up the slide again, please? So while that's being pulled up, um, you know, again, we uh, mentioned public open space mm -hmm. um, on specific sites within the MEC um, development. Uh, there's bulk setbacks of at least 10 feet along 125th Street. Um, we have height limits as well. Um, we also have um, a maximum height of 150 feet. Uh, and without some of these um, design controls, you can develop, um, as of right, very tall towers that will be out of context with the larger community and will actually uh, increase cost of construction and make uh, any new development that's coming forward um, more expensive due to construction typology. You could go back a few slides, but um, yeah, basically just what Viana said, the design controls that we would like to preserve for the site are the height limits, um, the minimum residential square foot footage requirement um, and the open space requirement on these sites. Right, and these slides that you're looking at, um, if you can go back one slide. Yes, these were um, uh, provided to us um, by CB11's um, consultant. And these were great examples of kind of what exists. Now with the design controls in place, um, you have contextual um, buildings, you have open space that's permitted. Um, again, that would not be required by zoning and you have height limits. So if you can go to the next slide. Without the urban renewal plan and some of the design controls that we're looking to preserve, especially for the future phases of the MEC site, which has not um, been uh, advanced yet. Um, these are some of the heights that can um, easily double. Um, and again, you know, open space, it's possible for them to them meaning future developers to not provide the open space. And so you can get um, a design that looks similar to this. And then the last scenario is if you can advance the slide. Um, you know, this, the buildings will triple in size. This is an unlikely scenario, but as of right, um, okay. you know, a developer can yeah. build tall towers. Um, and again, you know, the design controls help uh, provide more of a contextual balance, um, which is, is something that is, is really of a concern uh, citywide. Okay. Um, two more questions. Uh, why is the urban, urban renewal plan extension for 40 years and does this make it the best duration you believe? You go ahead. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, my name is again, Ariel Goldberg. I'm the director of land use and policy. Um, so we, there were sort of two main reasons. One reason is a typical extension of an urban renewal plan actually is about 40 years. Um, so this is sort of consistent with the way we typically do extensions. Um, the other reason is because um, as we were saying, these controls affect um, the design controls specifically affect these MEC sites. And at the end of 2019, we conveyed the first phase um, on the Western portion of the block of MEC. Um, and we conveyed it subject to these controls for 40 years, um, subject to the plan for 40 years. So essentially what we're doing is making subsequent phases consistent with that first phase. Okay. If, if I could just add um, to yeah. Ariel's point is that this is a question, you know, we went to the community board se several times and this was a question that they had. And um, we did r research on urban renewal plans extensions citywide and the 40 year um, number was fairly typical. Okay. Was typical, I should say. 
All right, I'm gonna ask one more question. Now I'm gonna allow, allow my colleagues, I believe Council Member Perkins had um, some questions, um, but um, Borough President Brewer recommended that HPD updated the BP's office and the community board every five years regarding the status of HPD acquisition plans for any sites within the URP area. Uh, does that seem like something that's practical or feasible that could happen? If we could unmute, maybe. Oh, you're good, James. But I just said, it, it, please don't mute yourself because we have to extend an invitation for you to unmute <laughs> each other. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Yeah, just trying to not um, unintentionally be speaking. Um, so um, I think one of the things that's worth knowing is, you know, the borough teams, the Manhattan Borough Planning Team, they engage with the community board all the time for various projects. Um, and so I think they have a regular relationship with them. And if we are going to be pursuing any acquisition, that is certainly something we would engage on. But it's this sort of increments of five or 10 years, they don't necessarily make um, they don't fit necessarily with the reality of how such an acquisition would come up. Um, and any acquisition would require um, a public hearing for notification. So I think, you know, there are built, there are built in requirements and there's also this ongoing relationship between um, HPD's borough teams and the community board that lend itself probably to, you know, more frequent updates um, if, if there are any updates to be had. Okay. I believe as long as there's a transparent conversation with the community boards and the borough president's office, I think everyone will be at ease um, during the situation. All right, um, thank you, I really appreciate that. And now I would like to invite my colleagues if they have any questions. I know um, Council Member Perkins um, had um, some questions before. So uh, Council Member Perkins, um, would you like to ask your question? I just wanna get a sense of uh, the time frame in which this project will come to its fruition. How much time as, this, uh, we, as we move along on this project what will it take? Are you speaking specifically about the next phase of the MEC sites? Yes. Okay. Vianda, do you I, have a sense of the timeline? I think she muted herself, so we have oh. to probably send her. Okay. I, I just heard her, so I don't know. Well, there you go, there you go. Yes, I'm back. Thank you. So yes, we, um, as Ariel mentioned, the first phase is under construction, which is exciting. And we're working with the development teams to um, advance the next two phases. We're hoping, um, especially with a lot of the starts and stops with the city government and a lot of projects being put on hold, we're hoping that that will advance um, in this new administration. So uh, the next phase, it, it will take a, approximately a, at least a year um, to get underway once it starts advancing again. So um, the third phase is further out. So I hope that answered your question, Council Member Perkins. Thank you for that. And, and when you say further out, how further out is it in terms of time frame? Can, um, does that make sense? Yeah, that's a great question. I, at, at this point, I can't speculate, unfortunately. Um, once the second phase gets underway and we have the construction timeline, um, then that third phase can can advance forward. Yeah. Hopefully, so the, in the next five years. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Hopefully, keep hope alive. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Perkins. Uh, Councilmember Barron has a question. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I've been in and out, so I haven't heard the testimony nor all of the questions, but. Uh, just wanted to know, the, the terms are asking for a 40-year range. And so my question is, why is it 40 years? And are we locked into that 40 years? Or is there another option that should we find that circumstances and situations uh, require a change? Can, we, can the city council come back and make an amendment to the 40 years and reduce it? I'll let Ariel answer that. Sure. Um, so, um, so in terms of the 40 years, I think um, I'll, I'll refresh what I said 
prior, which is that it was 40 years for two reasons. One is because that's it's a fairly typical extension period, particularly for something that is right on the edge of expiring as opposed to expiring in 10 or 20 years from now. Um, the other reason is we just recently conveyed at the end of 2019, the first phase of MEC, which is subject to the plan for 40 years. So essentially we're making subsequent phases consistent with that first phase. They're literally on the same block um, and have the, des the design controls that would stay in effect. Um, in terms of the 40 year period, so once a site is conveyed, it's subject to, you know, sold to the developer. It's subject to the restrictions of the plan that was in place at that time. Um, so unless there is an agreement between, so let's say hypothetically, there were an amendment to be passed after it, the site has been conveyed um, that would have to be agreed upon between both the city as well as the developer to be subject to that new plan because you can't retroactively change uh, restrictions um, that they are subject to after they already own the site. Um, and any urban renewal plan amendment, um, HPD would need to be the applicant on because we're the urban renewal, the agency um, with urban renewal authority. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Council Member Barron. And I just want to take this time to acknowledge uh, my colleagues that just entered, uh, Council Member Levine and Council Member Margaret Chin um, had just entered also. Um, Council, are there any more questions for this panel? If there aren't any more council member questions, please raise your hand now. I see no other council member questions. There being no more questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? There are no members of the public signed up to testify on this item. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, Chair Riley, you can close the public hearing on this item. That's on page 19. Gotcha. Then there being no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on application number C 210067 HUM is now closed. Our next item is LU725, the Everlasting Pine HDFC ground lease amendment. This application was submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development for approval of an urban development action area project located at 96 Baxter Street in Council Member Chin's district. Council Member Chin, would you like to give any remarks to this project? Thank you, uh, Council Member Riley. It's good seeing you. Good seeing you too. And uh, this is not an easy committee. It's a very busy committee and we're glad that you are taking charge. Um, I just wanted to uh, echo my, I mean, to say my support for this project and I'm really uh, looking forward to HPD's uh, presentation. Uh, this senior building uh, has been in my district for more than 20 years. And the residents, I mean, there's a hundred, over a hundred residents, this 88 unit, and some of the residents are over a hundred years old. <laughs> and the council, we have, you know, supported um, the development with social service support. And it's amazing how active these seniors are. And we just hope that the building will continue uh, with uh, city support uh, to be a long-term uh, senior housing with some of the renovation that's really needed. And it's such a great place. And they have a beautiful garden uh, community room on the 13th floor, which welcome you to visit when this whole pandemic is over. Uh, so I just want to voice my um, support and, and really want to see this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chen. Looking forward to visiting the project. <laughs> Council, please call the applicant panel. 
The applicant panel for HPD is Libby Rolfing, Kerry Labotz, I hope I get this right, Ziumara Pedraza, and Franz Hewitt. Council, please administer the affirmation. Uh, panelists, a moment, let's unmute everyone. I see you, Jeez. Where's Fran is Franz here? Libby, do, is Franz here? I, I I'm not oh, seeing him. Not okay, so we'll proceed. Okay. So if you could all raise your right hands. I don't think Kerry's unmuted. Where's Kerry? No, Kerry is unmuted. Oh, she's not. Um, so please raise your right hand. Do you affirm, please state your names and Please Libby state. Rolfing. Diomara Pajaza. Carrie Labatz. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions. I yes. do. I do. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation again for the record, and then you may begin. I'm Libby Rolfing. I'm the Chief of Staff at the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development. We are here today um, with an action seeking UDAP designation, disposition and project approval, as well as an urban renewal plan amendment in order to rehabilitate a project known as Everlasting Pines located at 96 Baxter Street, Block 198, Lot 126 in Manhattan Council District 1 um, here, and I'll refer to this as the disposition area. Everlasting Pines is a senior housing project rehabilitated under HBD's HUD multifamily program, which leverages public resources and private sector financing to rehabilitate, recapitalize, and preserve privately owned HUD assisted rental housing throughout New York City. The program's mission is to ensure low income New Yorkers remain in affordable apartments over the long term, to promote financial and physical stability, and to promote revitalized neighborhoods. The city currently ground leases the disposition area to Walker Street Chung Pak Local Development Corporation, the LDC, and the LDC sublets it to the sponsor, Chung Pak Local Development Corporation. The disposition area is located adjacent to the Manhattan Detention Complex, which will undergo a seven year demolition and replacement as part of the creation of a borough based jail system. The comprehensive points of agreement related to the closure of Rikers Island outlines HPD's commitment to provide a stabilization loan to address immediate capital needs to protect the senior housing during this process, including HVAC upgrades, window replacement and a rooftop enclosure. In keeping with this commitment, HPD will provide a loan to the sponsor for the rehabilitation of the disposition area. In addition, HPD will amend the ground lease term from a term of 49 years to a term of 99 years. The sponsor will enter into a regulatory agreement restricting rents and incomes on the disposition area. The project currently fully occupied provides approximately 87 rental dwelling units plus one dwelling unit for a superintendent. Anticipated area median income targets to be reflected in the HPD regulatory agreement will be up to 50% of area median income, which is 39,800 for a single household, but the tenants will not pay more than 30% of their income in rent. The existing section eight HAP payments, which represent the subsidy that HUD is paying to the project are 1,387 for a studio and 1,688 for a one bedroom, but tenants are only responsible for the tenant share, which is much lower because of the federal assistance. Currently, the average tenant share paid is $254, which is equivalent to a rent of approximately 13% of area median income. So today, HBD is before the subcommittee seeking approval of the Everlasting Pines project 
in order to preserve this affordable senior residential building. Uh, we do have um, a presentation. Um, if you could put up the slides, that would be great. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Carrie Labatz, um, just to walk through the deck real quick. Thank you, Libby. Um, thank you, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carrie Labatz. I'm the hey. Assistant Commissioner of Preservation Finance at the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Um, just to uh, walk through this, next slide, next slide please. Um, to give you, uh, and some of this will just um, be a highlight of what was in the testimony, but um, just to remind folks that the um, HUD multifamily program, which is providing the assistance for this project, um, provide, leverages public resources and private sector financing to rehabilitate, recapitalize, and preserve privately owned HUD-assisted rental housing uh, throughout New York City. The program, uh, through that, we provide tax exemptions um, and can also provide low interest loans in order to preserve uh, the projects as well. Um, and the projects must be 100% HUD assisted to be eligible for the program. Next slide, please. The Everlasting Pines project um, is a HUD 202 senior housing development with 88 units, all of which are covered by a project-based contract. The project is adjacent to the Manhattan Detention Complex, which will be demolished and replaced as part of the creation of the borough-based jail system. And in October 2019, a points of agreement was entered into in which HPD agreed to provide a loan to address the immediate capital upgrades to mitigate the impacts of the demolition. Uh, this is uh, three scope items, replacement of the HVAC system, replacement of the windows, and a rooftop enclosure. Next slide, please. The project, which is located in Chinatown at 96 Baxter Street, is comprised of 38 studios and 51 bedroom apartments, um, which is, includes a supers unit. Um, as part of our assistance at closing, we will provide a regulatory agreement. That regulatory agreement will mirror the HUD restrictions and restrict households who qualify um, to 50% at or below 50% AMI, which is 39,800 for a single household. And because of the HAP assistance, the federal assistance, the tenant share of rent is 30% of their income. The HAP, the HAP contract covers payments to the buildings in the amount of 1,387 units. Uh, dollars for studios and $1,688 for one bedroom. Uh, tenants are only responsible for 30% of their income, which uh, on average in the building represents about $254 per month in terms of the tenant responsibility, which is approximately 13% AMI. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the project is on city owned land. We'll be extending the DCAS ground lease from 49 years to uh, 99 years. Uh, so HPD as part of this action is seeking to provide um, a UDAP authority with article 16 loan and administer and amend the ground lease from 49 years to 99 years. Um, administration of the residential portion of the ground lease will also be transferred to HPD um, at closing. Thank you, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Um, I just have three questions uh, I want to ask. Uh, the first one is the application states that the stabilization loan will include three capital projects, um, excuse me, three capital improvements per the Rikers Island points of points of agreements, HVAC upgrades, window replacements, and rooftop um, enclosures. Could you please provide additional details on those plan improvements? Gary, do you want to take that one? Sure, happy to. Um, so the, uh, let's see, uh, the, the window replacement will upgrade and replace the windows um, with the emphasis on uh, noise mitigation. Um, so the windows um, will be fully replaced with high, high performance windows. Um, the HVAC system right now, um, it's my understanding that the project has um, window through air conditioner units. So as part of um, the HVAC replacement, the the, um, the area in which the sleeves come through the facade of the building will be bricked over and there will be um, in-unit um, split, um, split systems. So tenants have control of heating and cooling. And then the rooftop enclosure will provide um, 
uh, an enclosure area for the, the open patio space on the 13th floor. So tenants um, may enjoy use of that, that patio throughout the year and throughout the construction and demolition. Okay. The current rent are listed as $1,387 for a studio, $1,688 for one bedroom. On average, what portion of this rent will tenants actually be paying? The tenant share is 30% of their income. So in order to qualify for the, to, for the building, um, tenants uh, must qualify, households must be earning at or below 50% AMI. Um, at, after that, tenants are only paying 30% of their income. So a tenant earning 20% AMI can qualify to, um, for an apartment in the building. However, their, their tenant share will always only be 30% of their income. So I think another way to think of it is that the big numbers that I was speaking about, the 1300, I think 1600, those are really payments to the building um, via, the, via the HUD contract. Tenants um, will never pay more than 30% of their income and tenants who are in the building only qualify if they earn at or below 50% AMI. Okay. And my last question, and I really wanna focus on this because of the time we're in and I really wanna, mm -hmm. Uh, emphasize helping out our union. So I want to know if this building will be built um, with union, unionized labor. Um, I definitely think it's very important moving forward that we definitely you know, take this into consideration with a lot of projects uh, within our city, especially because we're a union-based city. So will this project be um, built on unionized labor? Currently, there is no requirement for the rehabilitation uh, to be completed uh, with union labor. Okay. All right. I think that's something we should speak about. Um, Council member Barron, um, do you have any questions? Council member Barron's unmuted. Can someone unmute? Councilman Barron? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear you, Councilman. Okay, great, thank you. Yes, my question is, what is the connection between this project and Rikers Island? I heard reference to Rikers Islands in, in the description for this project, and I wanted to understand what's the connection. Libby, do you want me can to you hear me? Um, sure, go ahead. Um, in, in terms of, I am not well versed in the borough-based jail um, agreement. However, it's my understanding um, that is part of um, of the of Rikers Island. Um, I believe being decommissioned that there are um, that there is work taking place on existing jails within the five boroughs. Um, the connection is that as part of that agreement, the Manhattan Detention Center, which is next door to the Everlasting Pines project is going to be demolished and rebuilt. And as part maybe of if the, there's anything more eloquent to say about that. No, I just would um, add that as part of the agreement, HPD agreed to provide a loan to the project to do some upgrades so that during um, the construction, these upgrades will help mitigate um, from any effects from that. And what's the cost of this project? We're anticipating putting a rehabilitation loan of approximately $8 million. 85? $8 million, excuse me. That has not been finalized yet, but that's what we're, uh, that's what we're estimating right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Uh, Councilmember Chin, you have a question? Can we unmute Council Member Chen, yeah. please? Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, I think I just wanted to um, also address uh, the question that Council Member Barron had. I mean, last year when we voted, uh, or maybe more than a year ago, it's been so long for the Borough Base project. And in my district, because Manhattan Detention Center is right next to the senior building, and we want to make sure that the seniors are protected uh, during the the construction demolition uh, process. And at the same time, we wanted to see what else we can do for the senior building. So I'm glad to, to see that we can extend the ground lease 
to 99 years. And I think my question is that, how do, is there some guarantee written in there that this has to remain as a senior building, senior citizen building? Or that's a given? Um, it, for HPD, when our, regu our regulatory agreement will require the project to remain a senior building. Um, right now, there's also a HUD um, 202 loan, uh, which is a, a loan targeted to senior assist, to assist senior projects. And that also requires um, seniors um, in terms of population. Do you, um, do you know if all the apartments are accessible? I mean, they all have a ba bathroom that, that are accessible to wheelchairs so that the renovation don't have to include that? Um, it's our understanding. Excuse me. Yeah, I yeah I I I'm not sure, but that's what I'm asking whether um, the the management office or the um, the agency that knows that if the like all the apartments are already um, accessible that they don't have to do any changes like whether bathroom needs to be uh, widened to allow wheelchairs or, or other upgrade that need to be done besides window HVACs and other things? Um, it's our understanding that nine of the 88 units are accessible. Oh, only nine? That's correct. Um, it's oh. our understanding that the, built, the building was built to UFAS standards, but in terms of the accessibility, um, that you're describing in terms of the, the shower, roll in showers and uh, turn radius, it's our understanding that nine of the 88 are accessible. Okay. So I guess we also need to work with the building to see if there are other adjustments um, that need to be made uh, because some of the seniors are aging in place. So when they moved in when they're 62 and now they're like 80, 82, like 20 some years later and they might have some additional needs. So that. That is something that they, um, that HPD should really work with, um, um, you know, the building um, owner, I mean, the building uh, provider to see if besides window and, and roof and, I mean, uh, enclosing the outdoor uh, garden, which is really nice, um, and the HVAC system. Okay, that, that, was my, uh, that was my question. Thank you, Chair. No problem, Councilmember Chen. There being no more questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Thank you. Council, are Thank there you. any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Council? There are no members of the public here to testify on this item. There, there being no other members of the public who wish to testify, the public hearing on LU 725 is now closed. Our next item is LU 724, the Landmark Preservation Commission designation of East 25th Street Historic District in East Flatbush in council district represented by council member Lewis. Uh, is council member Lewis um, available or? Uh, she's not here yet. She may okay. attend shortly. No problem. Council, can you please call on the applicant panel? The applicant panel for the Landmarks Preservation Commission is Kate Lemos Mikhail and Anthony Fabray. Council, can you please administer the affirmation? Applicants, can you please raise your right hands and state your names? Kate Lemus McHale. Anthony Fabre. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record, and you may begin. Uh, thank you. I'm Kate Lemus McHale, Director of Research for the Landmarks Preservation Commission. And I'm Anthony Fabre, Director of Community and Intergovernmental Affairs at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Thank you. You may begin. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Riley, and good afternoon, subcommittee members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present the East 25th Street Historic District in Brooklyn in Council District 45, which was designated on November 17th, 2020. And we have a presentation, if that could be shared, please. Uh, thanks, and the next slide, please. <clears throat> Great, thank you. The East 25th Street Historic District is a remarkably cohesive group of 56 row houses built by a single developer, the Henry Meyer Building Company, between 1909 and 1912. All were built in the Renaissance Revival style and remain very well preserved. Uh, LPC reviewed a request to evaluate this block from its block association <clears throat> with support from council member Farrah Lewis and the Historic Districts Council. And we work closely with the community having our first um, outreach meeting with property owners via Zoom last spring and are very grateful for their support. At the public hearing on September 22nd, eight people spoke in favor of the proposed designation, including representatives of Community Board 17, the East 25th Street Block Association, Historic Districts Council, the New York Landmarks Conservancy and residents of the district. In addition, uh, the commission received 17 written submissions in favor of designation, uh, including from New York City Council member Farrah Lewis, New York State Assembly member Rodney's Bichot, representatives of the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, Vanderveer Park United Methodist Church, East 26th Street Block Association and residents of the district. We also received a petition from the East 25th Street Block Association supporting designations of, uh, and that was signed by 66 people. And we received no opposition to the proposed district. Next slide, please. The historic district extends along both sides of East 25th Street between Clarendon Road and Avenue D in Brooklyn's Flatbush neighborhood. In determining the boundaries of the district, LPC staff analyzed a broader area and concluded that this block stands out within its larger neighborhood for the quality and consistency of its architecture and its high level of integrity. Next slide, please. These maps illustrate uh, this. It's the three major factors that contribute to its quality. It's construction within a very short time frame by one developer, its architectural consistency all in the Renaissance Revival style, and its very high integrity. Uh, next slide, please. Flatbush was initially its own town, developing separately until its annexation by the city of Brooklyn in 1894. Although the Brooklyn, Flatbush, and Coney Island Railroad linked the neighborhood with downtown Brooklyn as early as 1878, Flatbush remained largely rural until the 1890s. This 1873 map shows the location of the historic district on what was still the Vanderveer Farm, and you can see Prospect Park to the northwest. Uh, next, please. Residential development in Flatbush was originally focused um, in areas directly east and south of Prospect Park in the late 19th century. Important early developments um, include areas that are now historic districts, including the Prospect Park South Historic District with its opulent freestanding houses and suburban developments such as Ditmas Park, Fisk Terrace and Midwood Park and also Prospect Lefferts Gardens Historic District. Um, the East 25th Street Historic District is the first historic district in the eastern part of Flatbush. Next, please. In the early 20th century, as this map shows, the area around the historic district was still mostly rural, with wood frame buildings scattered around um, an incomplete street grid. Next, please. But within a few years, new transportation routes spurred intensive development around East 25th Street. Major transportation improvements included the Nostrand Avenue streetcar line, five blocks east, which crossed the new Williamsburg Bridge in 1906 and linked Flatbush with Manhattan's Lower East Side. West of the historic district, the upgrade and expansion of the Brighton Railroad in 1908, which is now the B&Q lines, uh, was heralded as a great transportation highway for the city. Next, please. 
the Henry Meyer Building Company purchased the site of the historic district in the spring of 1909. It had been part of a former farm outlined here in blue, um, established by Julius Jans Vanderveer soon after leaving Holland in 1659. In 1790, it still belonged to the family, to his grandson, and the household at that time consisted of five white males, five white females, and 10 enslaved people whose genders were not recorded. The farm was known to generations of Flatbush residents for its enormous windmill, shown here, that sheltered African-American families seeking refuge during the 1863 draft riots. By the 1890s, Vanderveer descendants began selling off portions of the farm. Next slide, please. Henry Meyer, who developed the historic district, was born in Germany in 1864 and immigrated to the United States as a teen. Starting in the 1890s, his firm constructed approximately 700 houses in the Cypress Hill section of Brooklyn's East New York neighborhood, possibly due to his membership in the Cortelyou Club near East 25th Street. He ventured into the Flatbush Market and the earliest houses on East 25th Street were completed by the end of 1909. In the advertisement shown on the right, um, he claimed, we transformed East New York from a wilderness to a city. We are now operating in Flatbush and are going to duplicate our former success. The ads of the development company highlighted the area's excellent transit faci facilities, clubs and schools, and the privacy that only a single family house could offer and, and the modern features and comforts of the, of the homes. Uh, next slide, please. The East 25th Street houses were designed in the Renaissance Revival style, featuring limestone or brownstone fronts, full height, rounded or angled projecting bays, foliated keystones, and classically ornamented entrance surrounds and cornices. Each of the two rows on either side of East 25th Street is symmetrical, and the two rows are mirror images of each other. So you have this incredible sense of place when you walk down the block. Unlike similar houses constructed elsewhere in Brooklyn at that time uh, that were constructed as more affordable two-family homes, these were built as single-family homes, reflecting Flatbush's affluent reputation. The architect of record was a small Williamsburg firm, Gluecroft and Gluecroft, which may have based the design on slightly earlier row houses in Prospect Lefferts Gardens. Uh, next, please. This map from soon after the district was built gives a sense of its remarkable cohesiveness, which in addition to the quality of the architecture stands out in the surrounding area. This area's irregular grid and short and angled streets and its history of primarily small scale development contributed to a variety of building types in masonry and wood. Um, buildings tended to be built individually or in small groups, making the long unbroken rows of East 25th Street especially distinctive here. The block to the east on East 26th Street was also developed by Meyer, but those houses are a different style, quality, and are much less intact than the block of East 25th Street. Uh, next, please. During the early years, the houses in the district were owned and occupied by the families of white merchants and other upper middle class professionals. Notable early residents of the historic district included suffragist Nellie Marshall, who marched in Brooklyn's first suffrage parade in 1913 and remained active in the Flatbush Political Equality League for several years afterward. Flatbush native Austin J. Tobin, who led the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey for 30 years, moved to 364 East, 26th Street, East 25th Street in 1929. Tobin had a major impact on reshaping New York and, and the region, spearheading major projects, including the World Trade Center. Next, please. In recent decades, ownership of the block has come to reflect Flatbush's increasing diversity and the growth of its African-American and Afro-Caribbean communities. Today, most residents of the historic district have roots in Caribbean countries. Caribbean immigrants began buying houses on the block in large numbers in the 1970s and 80s, and were instrumental in founding the East 25th Street Block Association in 1985. The association has played a leading role in cultivating and fostering the block's remarkable community spirit, organizing a variety of block-wide programs since then. 
uh, since first entering the Brooklyn Botanic Garden's greenest block in Brooklyn contest in 1999, for example, the East 25th Street Block Association has earned uh, four first place finishes and numerous other honors. And you can see um, some of the members of the community celebrating that in this image. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the remarkable dedication of the district's homeowners and residents to the continuing beauty of their block is evident not only in the lush greenery of the front yards, but in the outstanding integrity um, of the buildings and the care that has been given to their preservation. Um, and this image um, is of residents of the block celebrating the designation of the historic district on November 17th, um, shown here with council member Farrah Lewis and one of our uh, LPC research, research staff um, who was there as well. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope you will vote to uphold this designation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Chair Riley, you're muted. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I uh, just have two questions. Uh, can you speak to the outreach and engagement process for this historic uh, district designation, please? Oh, sure. Um, so this is, um, we received what is called a request for evaluation um, for the historic district from um, the Block Association. And that came with information and support letters about the district. And then the we, um, LPC staff did a, a lot of uh, evaluation of the neighborhood, looking at the block within the broader context to determine if um, it merited designation on its own or if there was um, a, a different boundary we should be looking at. Did a lot of research um, and had meetings with um, Julia Charles and the Block Association and the council member. Um, and then when we began to move forward, then we started um, an owner outreach with, with more property owners. And this was during the um, early part of the pandemic actually. And so normally we like to be face to face in a community and have meetings in person to explain our study, to um, explain the research that we've done and also to talk with people about how to work with the Landmarks Commission um, once um, they may own a property that would be designated and to answer any questions. So we did that over Zoom and it actually turned out to be um, a useful tool that we've used since um, to have other similar meetings. So um, this was a, a, a district that we did have a lot of support. We had great conversations with people. And so um, before we calendared, we always like to know that there's um, support. Okay, my last question is, how did this process differ from previous LPC designations in other neighborhoods? Well, I think that there's, you know, we're always doing our own research and survey and evaluation. And sometimes things come to us from advocates asking us to look at something. Sometimes things come to us directly from the community asking us to look at, you know, their block or their neighborhood. And sometimes we identify things. So there is a range of how this can go. Um, and But, you know, it's particularly rewarding when the people living in a historic district really want to be um, to become a historic district. Okay. I think, I mean, Kate already mentioned this, but the biggest difference is probably that we, um, although we started in person to do outreach, um, we had to move on to doing um, outreach virtually. So that's probably the biggest difference from other um, designations, but um, that will change now, of course, since we, we're moving forward with other um, online meetings, so. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, thank you, I really appreciate the presentation. Uh, I think this is gonna be great for that community in uh, Flatbush. I actually learned something myself. I did not know Flatbush was a, a town within the town. So that is, that is very, you know, great to learn uh, today. And um, I just wanna take this time to invite my colleagues if they have any questions. Um, Council, is there any questions from any of my colleagues? I see no council members with questions. Good. There being no more questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Thank you. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? There are no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. 
There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Oh, sorry. <laughs> There being no other members of the public who wish to testify, the public hearing on LU724, the designation on East 25th Street, Historic District is now closed. Uh, council, do we wanna go back to affirm the vote uh, from the earlier? Yes, so I want to clarify that the today's vote on LU711 is three in the affirmative, zero in the negative with one abstention. And on LU 717 is four in the affirmative, zero in the negative with zero abstentions. And both items are recommended to the full land use committee. And uh, you can now close the vote. Thank you. All items heard today during this meeting are laid over. That concludes today's business. I remind you that if you have any written testimony on today's item, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or the project name in the subject heading. I would like to thank the applicants, members of the public, my colleagues, subcommittee council, land use staff, and the Sergeant at Arms for participating in today's hearing. This meeting is here.